Dig with everyone, Kojima Toshi, and welcome back to episode number 63, I think it is, of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. We are at the end of the NFA bootleg series, lads, it's broke my heart. I'm going to miss this series so much, and almost like how you eat the crust of your sandwich first, so you end on a nice middle bit with all the ingredients in one bite, some could say I've left the best to last in this series. I, I can't say that, because I legit loved every single episode I did out in America. Genuinely, equally, loved them all. But, you could maybe say it. Because this week's guest on Inline G is Flute Center CEO and co-owner Julian Rose. Now, lads, I loved this episode. This was fascinating to understand how a company like Flute Center has risen from relatively humble beginnings to the behemoth it is in the flute world now. Um, so you're going to see a lot of me just asking questions, really. I'm going to go off script a lot. I'm like a big child. It's like Christmas because Julian is a flute and business encyclopedia and I just couldn't help myself. I was having a blast. So if you want to know all about what goes into creating a flute heaven like Flute Center, this episode is a gem. I've listened to it back myself, which I never do, but I enjoyed it so much. So regular listeners, you know the score. Skip ahead a minute or two. But for everybody else... The Inline G podcast is free and always will be free. However, if you want to donate to the podcast, you can now do so through the Patreon. On the screen now is the address. For the audio listeners, it is patreon.com forward slash the Inline G Flute Podcast. It costs five quid a month. That's it. And with that, you're keeping this podcast alive. You get four episodes a month of this podcast. Come rain nor shine. I will always have an episode for you on a Friday. Now, if you listen to all four and you think, fuck, if I saw Gareth in the pub, I'd buy him a pint to say thank you. Well, you can do that digitally. This is the definition of an independent small podcast. Donating to the Patreon, you're supporting me and paying me for my work as an artist, which in 2024 is an incredible feeling to know I can do this. It also means I don't have to go looking for sponsors. I don't have to take on sponsors' wishes of saying things like, don't swear, don't talk about this topic, don't talk about mental health, don't talk about religion. I can do whatever I want here because you guys are paying for the podcast. You'll get what you want then. The idea of being a self-funded podcast in the flute world in 2024 is obscene. I never thought that would happen, but we are on the verge of making so much money in this podcast that I can keep it totally sponsor free. So please, if you can afford it, go sign, so go subscribe. When you hit subscribe, you can unsubscribe at any time. There's no minimum month or anything. You hit unsubscribe, you're out straight away. And you can jump in and out when you can afford to. So if you can afford to pay for it, please head over there. It's five quid a month. If you can't afford to pay for it, there's a cost of living crisis. We're all artists, maybe. We're struggling. I get it. That's fine. You can keep listening for free and you will get the same content as everybody else. It is a system based on kindness and on soundness. If you can afford to pay for it, you're paying for someone who can't afford to listen or to pay. So, also, usually this is where I plug uh, my affiliate link for Flute Center, but it feels a little bit weird today. But I'm going to do it anyway. So listen, lads, go to the description. You'll see what you get if you use the code inline G at the checkout for Flute Center. How bizarre is that? Anyway, without further ado, here is this week's Inline G Flute Podcast with the encyclopedic Julian Rose. Now, what I normally do is I put in a little introduction to all my guests. Okay. And I'll say what they do. The problem is, I don't know how to sum up what you do because you do so many different things. So if someone walked up to you in the street and said, what's your job title? Or what, describe your career, describe what you do, what would you say? Oh, um, I'll give you two answers. So, what I would say, um, and what my team would say, right? Go for it, that's so, great. <laughs> what I would so say is I solve problems. Like, my job is to see the industry mm-hmm. and to see where it's going and yeah. to see the business that I work in and to solve the problems like okay and you know I just as a general theory the way we've had such success is by literally finding our weaknesses and attacking them and turning them into strengths yeah. um, so that's kind of what I do and you know we we are we can talk about this if you want but we are a business that has a certain set of core values and one mm-hmm. of the values that we have is being progress obsessed yeah and so 
when we see a weakness, we attack it. And so I, my job is to diagnose weaknesses, whether that's in the way that we procure inventory or the way that we're managing cash flow or you know, the way we're training our staff on how to sell flutes or, things, or yeah. the digital presence we have on social media or website. Yeah. We find the weaknesses and we attack them. We try to turn a weakness into a strength, you know, yeah. competitors. So if you ask me what I do, that's that's what I think I do. And what would your team say you do? <laughs> my team would say my proper title is visionary. Okay. Um, because I, that that's the role that I'm supposed to envision for the company. We're supposed okay. to in, inhabit Is that your company. actual, like, official job title? Uh, depending on how you look at it, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, you know, we have... Like any business, you kind of have a structure for how you run it, and yeah. we have a structure that does uh, bestow upon me the very gracious title of visionary. It's a cool title. Um, I like but that. But like you know, if you go to a bank, nobody, no bank wants to hear that your name, your title is visionary. So <laughs> true. Yeah. I okay. Also, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I also, I also have the title of CEO, so yes. that I can speak fluently with the other yes. business moguls in my life. The CEO, the, yeah, <laughs> that, that's a bit more, yeah, mainstream. Also, yeah. then we should talk about that. Congratulations on that, because you're now. Part owner? Part owner, yeah. That's yeah, right. since 1st of July, the official news July come out. July 1, 2024. Man, tell us about that. Congratulations. Yeah, so... so Tell us what that means, actually. That's really explaining. Explain yeah, the FM5. Yeah, 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 sure. So for all the uh, all the non, you know, Harvard business exactly, school yeah. graduates. Um, so I, you know, I started working for Blue Center in 2012. Yeah. And immediately took to the business and started cleaning things up and building the business and growing it. And saw success pretty soon after that and just kind of fell in love with the business. And for those first couple of years, um, you know, it felt, it, it became like my child, you know. And, yeah, I can get them. Yeah. And, um, you know, my wife didn't like some of the late nights and the weekends that I had where I worked and all that. But, you know, it, it really became a very personal thing for me. So in 2015, 2015, nine years ago, yeah. I approached Phil about buying in, about becoming a partner yeah. in the business. And to his credit, he was very open to it, you know, and, and this is 10 years ago almost. Um, and so we started talking and kept talking and kept talking. And he was always open to it, but there was always just, it, it kind of needed to happen on Phil's timeline, you know, okay. because he's, he and I have kind of opposing strengths um, okay. in business. Yeah. He is like the most personable person in the world and he's yeah. like he excels at personal relationships okay so like when he he has a network of thousands of people like i mean he yeah. has like like facebook before facebook existed yeah it's like yeah Phil, right yeah so he, he built just through sheer personality this like infrastructure for the business that was before i started and my strength is systems and building systems yeah so between the two of us we were able to like kind of join forces and so i was always telling him like if the two of us could ever actually come together and like align our interests we could we could do something really special. Yeah, yeah. And it kept getting derailed by various things, COVID being one of the big ones. Yeah. Um, and so when you're not even sure if the business is gonna survive. Yeah. Although yeah, to be course. honest, we did very well during COVID because so many people went um, into hobbies. Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah. But so, you know, it, eventually we started, you know, really getting serious and it, it was just so many questions. Like neither of us had ever done anything like this before. And when you start your own business and you, it's just you, it's. It's, 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 it's not simple, but it's not complicated. Okay. Makes, you, you, he owns the business, and that's just kind of that. But introducing a partner and just a lot of complexity, and so we okay. both had to hire lawyers and you know do the whole thing. And it was it was an extremely um, collegial and friendly process. Okay. And it took forever. How <laughs> long's forever? Nine years. It took you the whole nine years to get it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, we we were talking about it since July of 2015. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you know. It, the, the best part about the process was that at no point did I ever feel like it wasn't going to happen. I mean, okay. everyone around okay. me felt like it wasn't going to happen. Every, my wife, you know, my, my mother, my yeah, uncle. Nine like, years would make you think that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I think Phil felt the same way. I think Phil and I always kind of kind of got each other on like, okay. kind of a spiritual level. Like, like we both knew it was going to happen. We both knew it was meant to be. Yeah. There's a word in Yiddish, basher. It just means it's meant to happen. Right? Okay. Meant okay. to be. We both knew it was meant to be. We just had to figure out how to make it work. Okay. And so both of us were just really patient. And it happened kind of on the timeline it happened, and there were a bunch of obstacles and curveballs, but um, we kept inching closer and closer and closer, and then it finally happened. So it was officially announced on the 1st of July, but when yep. did you guys know it was all done and dusted then? We knew it was done like, like May. Okay. Yeah. And then from there, from May, it was like, 
we pretty much have everything done. The lawyers just have to like finalize certain technical words to make sure these legal implications are yeah, tied yeah. up, yada, yada, yada. And then I had to like, you know, cash out my investments and get all, put everything into cash and do yeah. all the kind of backend stuff and, okay. and be ready for the actual very large wire yeah. <laughs> that I had to send to him. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was. But it must have been a great moment and finally just done. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because like um, it, uh, July 1st was a Monday and I remember yeah. waking up on Monday morning and I, I checked my email first thing in the morning and I had the, um, the, the DocuSign packet in my email and I logged out real fast and I'm like, sign, 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 sign. I'm like, get it done. <laughs> and then that was it. When you sent it off, that was it. Well, that was it except that Phil had a countersign. Yeah. And so, and so I'm like checking my email all day long. What's the counter? you got to sign it. <laughs> you finally got to sign it at like 5 p.m. You maybe wait the whole day. Uh, <laughs> and like, what did you do after? You go out and celebrate? I, I had a nice stiff bourbon. Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> you sit down and just enjoy that. On your own, did you go out with Phil? No, actually, so we, we signed everything remotely. Okay. Um, I, I would like to have done that. We, we kind of thought about it, but it was just a weird day. And actually, my birthday is July 2nd. His birthday is July 3rd. Oh, okay. So we signed July 1st, July 2nd, July 3rd. And then you got a yeah. couple of celebrations you know? yeah. after that, yeah. So, yeah, we, we, we have not actually formally celebrated yet, but um, he'll be here tonight. To be honest, we have... Um, I haven't met him yet, actually. I'm just going to say hello to him at some point. Yeah, you should. Um, we... Um, We've kind of passed each other a good bit these last few weeks because he's been traveling a lot. He's got like six grandkids now, and he's just, oh wow, okay, yeah, he's just you know flying to go see them, and you know he's really into like live music, so he's been going to all these concerts. And so I, I go into the store twice a week to to see things, and I have kids, so I work from home three days a week. So we've just been passing each other a lot lately. Yeah, but, okay. You know, we'll see each other tonight. Have you seen each other since you've signed the contract? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, for sure, yeah, okay. for sure. But just like in, in work, you know, at the office, and yeah, okay. It's not really like you know drinks time. Although yeah, I guess we could nine a.m. bourbons, you know. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know if people are going to get that because I might have to digitally insert this sex in the ball fine, back yeah. in. So yeah. stay tuned for stay why we're talking about 9 a.m. bourbons. <laughs> that, that's a fun little tidbit. That's little, an Easter egg for later. Little teaser. Yeah. Uh, episode title for you there. Yeah, I, oh. <laughs> no, can I call our podcast 9 a.m. bourbons? 9 a.m. bourbons is that a bad idea? Is that a bad I idea for it? That sounds like a bad idea. I feel like I shouldn't do that. So I'm going to do 9 a.m. bourbons with CEO of Flute Center. Well, maybe tonight is that. <laughs> That does have a ring to it, though, to be fair. Uh, maybe tonight's the time to celebrate. Yeah, I Get think a few Bourbon Stein, celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you? Should, why not? And then if you just want to invite... You should come with us. Yeah, you know what, I want to go to all the cool parties. Oh, yeah, tonight's more monster party. Yeah, I've heard, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Here it gets wild. Yeah, I've heard, yeah. I don't know if I can say this on the podcast, but I really want to go to that one. You should. I didn't know, by the way, before coming to the NFA, first time again, I didn't know that the brands have their own parties. They do. They're and very they're exclusive. invite only. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because oh, I was yeah. at the side. I don't know. Can I tell people that I was at the Psyche one? Are they secret? Um, I mean, it's over now, so you can tell whoever you want. I won't tell. I like, <laughs> won't say what happened. Because what happens at the Psyche party stays first at the Psyche party. First rule of uh, Psyche party: Don't talk about Psyche party. <laughs> Man, it was so cool. Oh, I felt like a, I felt like a I felt like a celebrity. Because walking about, you're going like, oh, there's so and so, and there's them, and there's them, yeah, yeah. and you just having a drink together. Yeah, yeah. And also, shout out to Psyche. They put on some snacks, and they have these like peanut filled pretzels. Oh yeah. Peanut butter filled pretzels? Yep. Ooh. Yep. Well, thank you know what they're doing. So if I do make it to the Muramatsu party, they've got a high bar to get over in terms of the snacks. They just might They just might do it. Muramatsu party is uh, it's a real deal. I heard uh, last year they even had their own signature cocktail at the Muramatsu party. They, so we'll yeah, they have that. several. Dana Buick, the owner, she's like a total bartender. Yeah, she's like, she's great. I actually went to her, she and I had a meeting yesterday in her suite. So I, I, I've already sampled the uh, the bourbon. Um, you what know, have they got on the menu? Can you tell me? I, the only one I sampled was a bourbon cocktail. It's phenomenal. And I'm a bourbon person. Another uh, signature cocktail, one of their own ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She mixed it herself. She, she, they, they mix them and like. So seriously, she told me she like when she travels, she brings like all her bartending stuff because they're very Class. particular about about their drinks and they're phenomenal. They're they're excellent. So she, she they have these like um you know the swing cap bottles. Yeah. They're pre mixed um, pre mixed uh, signature cocktails. Yeah. And they have like. I don't know how many of them, but they have all these bottles of these premixed cocktails, and they're phenomenal. So yeah, you should, you should go. It's I'm behind the curtain now. I'm in the yeah, I'm in the club now. You are in the club. This yeah. is so cool. I, I didn't know this world existed, man. <sighs> yeah. Exclusive VIP parties. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I think I've managed to wangle my way into the mirror matching party. I think I've managed to get myself yeah. an invite. You should. No, it's very exclusive. So I think I've got my invite sorted for it. So. I will be going to that, and I cannot I'll, wait. You can come with me. Uh, I'll, I'll bring you, you along. Yeah, I can be your plus one. Sure. We awesome. Are. There we are. See, the yeah, last time I went to the Sankey one, <laughs> then I went out after with a couple of people. I went to a nightclub and all. And I didn't know NFA was so much fun. Honestly, NFA, I didn't yeah. know it was that much fun. It is. I, yeah. I have to recommend to everyone, especially people who aren't American, 
because it is like being on safari here. It's great. The it's Americans safari. are so much fun. <laughs> you just observing them in their natural look, habitat, look doing the, these American the Americans things. in their natural habitats. It's so much fun. You guys say the weirdest stuff, and it's so much fun. I love it. Yeah. Do you want know to keep hearing this holiday? What's that? I've been here three weeks. I appreciate you. I get that a lot. No matter what I do, people yeah. are like, I appreciate you. Americans are very sensitive. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. My, my own father hasn't told me he appreciates me that much. <laughs> and in the last three weeks, I've had everyone saying, I appreciate you. I'm like, man, thank you. <laughs> I don't think they do appreciate me. I think they're just looking at tip. Well, yeah. people are they, awesome. It's all, it's all about, you know, trying to make somebody feel comfortable. Whether they do or don't. It works. It's really about you. It generally works, though. Yeah. yeah. Thank God, yeah. yeah. Do you know what else I love about America? Last thing I have to say, just on this, because... In the hotel I'm staying at, there's a Denny's next door. Yeah. I knew nothing about Denny's, right? Last night, I'm going home, 1.30. I've had a few too many drinks. Say it's bedtime. Denny's is open. Yeah. And you can go in and sit down and have a meal drunk at half one in the morning. I had like a full breakfast, like hash browns and sausages. It was great. Yeah. God bless America, man. This is the greatest country <laughs> in the world. I'm staying here. I'm not leaving. You can go to Denny's at half one and get a French toast if you want. That's, that is actually so American of you. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and it was packed. There was so many people there. Everyone was drunk. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, everyone yeah. was blind drunk. It yeah, was great. Yeah, it, was it, was like a, it was like a twilight zone. It was a really bizarre yeah. moment. They actually take, they actually do a breathalyzer test at 1.30 on Denny's and if you don't, yeah. if you don't fail the, the breathalyzer, You're you can't even eat there. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about that I can digitally insert into the podcast? <laughs> That's fine. Are we good? <laughs> There's going to be a very seamless transition. Do you know what's going to happen? We're going to be talking about Denny's and put it back in. It's going to cut really harshly to a serious conversation about flutes again. It's going to be great. You guys can have that to look forward to. Uh, John Paul Wright on the podcast, JP. Right. I love calling him JP. It's very cool. Um, and he told me all about the Alto flute. Now, the Alto flute was his baby, and it hit the flute market, and it took over the flute world, to be fair. Especially at that, like, amateur level and sure. hobby players. Everyone's playing on a Trevor James Alto flute now. Yep. Everyone's got one. We sell, um, we sell a lot of them. Do you guys sell a lot of them? Yeah. Because they're cheap. Dozens like, they're and well dozens priced. and dozens of a year. I, I, I don't want to say hundreds, but I think it might be a hundred a year, yeah. Genuinely. Genuinely, yeah. What do you think your most popular product is? Just Sorry, on a quick tangent. Oh, I can say that for sure. Uh, but like a hundred Trevor James Alto flutes a year, so something like that's that. That's a lot of Alto flutes. A lot of Alto flutes, yeah. And if you'd said ten years ago you're going to sell a hundred Alto flutes a year, people call you mad. Probably would, yeah. But now they're flying off the shelves. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, most popular product is, it is. Uh, we, we can't keep it in stock, but it's the Gemeinhart 2 SP. It's the really. Least, yep, it's the least expensive student flute on the market. We'll sell like Gemeinhart um, flutes are great. Yeah, I, I love them. Yeah, and when we have them in stock, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's like printing money. Just, and they just know, go flying off the, off off the yeah. shelves. Uh, yeah, they're hard to keep in stock, though. They, Man, they really I, to be are. fair, the thing I love about them as well is they are sturdy. Yeah. Like, you can throw those things out windows and they're not you going can't anywhere. Throw out windows, yeah, yeah. You shouldn't. <laughs> you I shouldn't, shouldn't advertise in that podcast. Yeah, you, Do not sword, throw your flutes out the window. Sword fights are also a really fun thing to do. But if flutes. anyone wants to throw their good mind right. out a window or have a sword fight with it, <laughs> send the clip in and I'll share it on my Instagram. There you but go. Um, anyway, so continue that conversation. <laughs> yeah, the Alto flute hit the market, took it over. And I'm sort of curious, do you have any tips or like what you think might be the next thing? Because there's going to be another thing. Something's yeah, going to yeah, hit the yeah. flute market. I mean, everyone's kind of trying. And so like you had like the Lafrique craze that was like hit the market like five, six years That's ago. That's right. Are and they still being sold? They're still being sold, yeah. but they're, you know, we had a craze in like 2018. There was a craze. Everyone was on them, yeah. Petered off, yeah. Yeah. Um, These things do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's all sorts of little fads like that. Like during yeah. COVID, the Wind Defender. But we sold the wind hundreds defender. of those. Oh my Man, God. to be fair, I tried the Wind Defender the other day. Yeah. They are cool. They are yeah. cool. Like <laughs> the guy in there, uh, what's is it? Raw? I can't remember the guy's name that owns it, but anyway, he has a wind machine in there where you can play oh, the yeah? flute with the wind blown in your face while you're playing. It's oh, great. So funny. They are cool. Um, no, but I, so, okay, I, I don't know what the next big thing is, but I do know the thing that I kind of think is really cool. Okay. That I kind of hope becomes a thing, but yeah. I'm not sure it will because it's just, a, it's really niche. Right. So I, I love Bach. I love Baroque music. I love playing Baroque music. Yeah. And I love the sound of Baroque flutes. Um, they are gorgeous, yeah. So... Uh, there's a particular maker out of Montreal, Lavoie, and he makes a really good version of like a Baroque style head joint that just goes right into your silver flute. And oh, so, wow, okay. Yep, and it, it plays relatively in tune with, you don't, you don't have to worry about cross fingerings, you don't have to worry about ah. anything like that. You just put it right into your silver flute, and then it turns the sound of your instrument into a Baroque flute. And you can just play your, your Bach E minor, you know, your, your, your whatever. 
and Whoa. you sound like you're playing on a broke flute. And so, you know, it's funny when you're in college and like your, your professor's always like, use a different color here, use a different color here. Yeah. You're like, what the hell does that mean? What, yeah, the, what I, the hell is color? Don't right? start me on the color thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but you put that headroom in and you get it. You, like it is a different color for sure because you can't push the sound. That like, is the super embouchure interesting. The hole is so small. Yeah, because they are smaller in Brock flute yeah, time. So. That you can't push the air. You can't like, you know, honk out low Ds like yeah. you can on Chantelinos. Like you have to really coax the sound out and it creates this hollow woody sound that's like perfect for Baroque music. I love it. Um, so I kind of hope those take off. But Are you guys selling them at the minute then? I would love to have a reason to sell them. Yeah. Okay. We do have some Baroque style head joints that fit okay. into, into flutes. Okay. But they just don't move. And like for all the people out there who like call us and they tell us, I really want a, you know, a wood head joint so I can play Baroque music. Yeah. And then they try these and they're like, ah, this isn't for me. It's because... You know, like playing broke, playing older flutes, you, it's not like playing a modern flute. Like with a, on a modern flute, it's not a partnership, right? It's very much a flute player is in control. Yeah. The flute does what it says, what the, what the person says. Right? Yeah. It's very much a subservient relationship. Yes. yes. And on an older flute, everything made, you know, before 1950 or whatever, you have to kind of dance with the flute. Yeah. You have to ask them to dance, yeah. you know? And it's because the embouchure holes are smaller. There's a lot more resistance to the instruments. But... I think it makes it makes you a better flute player yeah. to learn how to play like that. I to, totally agree. Yeah, yeah, to open up your embouchure to to not be so concerned with forcing or pushing the yeah. sound. Um, that is to not be worried about playing fortissimo all the time. Yeah, yeah. I think these older flutes are, they have so much character as well, though they're yeah. so individual. And yeah. you you have to work with them. It's a relationship with the flute. It is. You have to really play with them, but they when it does work, it's so so nice. It I is. love older flutes. I would love to. I've never actually got to play a Louis Lot yet. Oh, we have like never ten of them. In yeah. The yeah. Do you have yeah. any here in NFA? I don't think we have them here. Ah. There. So when you're at an exhibit hall like this, like playing a flute like that yeah. sounds terrible in an exhibit. All the ambient noise and everything. Um, so you can't really hear the color. So no, but there's a, just add it to the reasons of why you should come to New there York. There we are. There yeah, you, you are. talk about ambient noise, man. The uh, I've been to the British convention. I've been to the French one, the German one. American one's a different ballgame. This is a different beast entirely. <laughs> and I came in here on the first day in the morning. I go say hello to everybody. I walked in. And within about 30 seconds, I heard the solo from Daphne's of Glory about eight times. Yep. I heard a couple of Shamanads. I heard a couple of Mozart G majors. That one pops up quite a lot. Yep. All at the same time. Yep. And I was like, man, yep. the no I, it's proper. Oh. Yep. And depending on the time of day, you'll get the 35 people all trying to their Prokofiev runs up to high Ds. Just, no. Just to make sure that they're getting the high Ds out, you know. No. Um, yeah, that, that's that's everyone's that's favorite. That's torture yeah. for the employees, man. Yeah. They have to listen to that all day. Or all the piccolo excerpts. Yeah, the the check for piccolo excerpt. You know. Yeah, I hear yeah. that one a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the everyone. biggest hits of them is time. You, I should make a list of like which ones I hear the most and tally yeah. them off. Oh yeah, well, like uh, you know, one year we're gonna have to do like a like an excerpt bingo card. Yeah, exactly you know? that. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I get oh, it's, for me this one is definitely Daphnis. I'm hearing a lot of Daphnis. Yeah. Yeah. So well, Louis Law wouldn't really work, I suppose, in that sense. Yeah. I would love to try one. Um, yeah. Okay, one fun question I just want to ask is came to my head now as well. I don't know if you can say this in the podcast. If not, we can delete it. But what's the most expensive flute you guys have ever sold? Or what's the most expensive flute right now? Like if you wanted a brand new flute, what would be the most expensive flute you could get at Flute Center? Um, right, okay, yeah, I'll answer both questions. Um, so the most expensive flute we have on for sale right now is a solid platinum Hanes. Oh. Um, with a 14 karat gold mechanism, oh. uh, fully loaded, so offsets, what is C sharp, D sharp, roller. Um, How much is that going for? Eighty four thousand oh. dollars. Yeah. Okay, honestly, thought it was going to be more. <laughs> That's I don't want to say it's cheap, but I thought it was going to be over a hundred. Yeah, no, no. That's uh, not too bad. We could. I mean, if you want, if you're in the market, I'm happy to sell it to you for a hundred thousand. Oh, I, <laughs> man, I wish. Um, no, eighty four thousand. Um, the most expensive flute I ever sold was also a platinum Hanes. Gold Mac. I Ooh. sold. I sold that one for, I want to say seventy six thousand. This was a few years ago before prices went 76, up. Seventy six thousand. Yep. Seventy six thousand. The guy paid fifty six thousand uh, by wire transfer and twenty thousand in various trades. Oh. So we took like um, like four or five very nice instruments for a total value of twenty thousand dollars off his hands. Um, yeah, Japanese engineer. Which, by the way, goes th- uh, side story here. Professional flute players don't buy platinum. Professional flute players, some buy gold. But the people who really buy the high-end flutes are like engineers and doctors. Like, okay. Yeah, which goes back to the whole idea of like our business model is very much about supporting all types of players, yeah. all walks of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not being solely focused on like 
you know, just professionals, which by the way, is why we do all the content we do. Like uh, if we were only focused on professionals, why would we have content about what a, what a clean oil adjust is? Exactly, you know, yeah. Or on, on excerpts or all the masterclasses we yeah, do. Yeah, true. Yeah, I think one of the things I would love to do if I worked in one of those flute shops would just be to go and play these like really sure. high end flutes. It must be like Disneyland for you guys. It must be fun like when you get a, like a really special instrument coming. Do you guys all get to have a go on it? And of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We encourage our employees to play uh, new instruments when they come in. Yeah. Yeah. Do you and by the way, you don't anybody listening, and of course, you yeah, know, you don't have to work for us to come play all of our instruments. You can just come. You don't even have to be in the market. Just if you find yourself in New York. Really? Yeah. You find, you find, find yourself in New York, <laughs> book an appointment, come on in. Can I come in just, and play some gold flutes? And of course you could. Yeah. Seriously. Because yeah, yeah. I did this a couple of years ago in Paris where I told the people in the shop I was going to buy a new flute. Mm -hmm. I was going to buy a new flute, but I had no intention of buying a 14 karat gold flute because I'm not made of money. But I was like, oh, no, can I try them out? And I tried them out just because I wanted to play them. But I felt like they were a bit like, hmm, are you really going to buy one? And they weren't very nice. I thought, I would just love to contact the food shop and say, I just want to come in and play them. I mean, if you if you come in and tell us, I just want to play some flutes. I'm not I'm not going to buy, but I just want to play like some gold Brandons. That's honestly okay. We would be absolutely happy to just like pull a couple gold flutes for you. Seriously. Set you up in a room and let you have some fun. Honestly. I want to go. Do you have any gold flutes at the convention, though? Oh, dozens, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, Brannons, Burkharts, Haynes, Powells, Nakaharas, I have to go I have to go and play some yeah. of these flutes, man. This is so good. All of them. All I haven't the played a single flutes. flute this whole convention. It's been great. I haven't touched <laughs> the flute once. It's been heaven for me. Uh, what else? Do you know what I wanted to talk about as well? Just when we're yeah. talking about the topic. Paris. You lived in Paris as well. You studied in Paris. I did, yeah. Tell people about this. I didn't know this, man. Yeah, well, where, where does the story start? Um, uh, you know... I guess I figured in college, Aaron Copeland started uh, studying in Paris, so True. I was studying in yeah. Paris too. But um, I guess it all kind of started in high school. Um, I was kind of a, I was a nerd. I shouldn't even try to hide it. Um, nerds are cool these days, by the way. Nerds are awesome. I love nerds. Nerds are in. Yeah. Um, basically, you have to be a nerd to be my friend at this point. Like I, I, have, I have no intention of being friends with anyone who isn't a nerd. If you're not like, yeah. passionate about something weird, yeah. I don't want to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> and flute, flute falls in that category. Oh, for 100%. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so I was in high school, I was a good student, and I got very good grades, and uh -huh. so when I got to, I, I went to VCU for undergraduate, well, all of my AP and IB credits transferred to college credits. Okay. And so I started college with two years done. Oh, nice, okay. Mm -hmm. And I was on a full ride, full like, academic ride. Like so, full scholarship all paid for? Yeah, yeah, full, full scholarship, yeah, with stipend, right? So with living expenses. Nice. Um, so after two years of being in college, I only had one class left to take, which is okay. English 201, which is like your, your research paper. Okay. That's all I had to take left. Okay. Um, so I talked to my advisor and she was like, you could graduate next semester if you want. And I was like, I don't want to graduate. I have all this, you're paying me like $5,000 a semester just to go to school. Like why, why would I want to do I'm that? I'm not you know? going anywhere. <laughs> um, so she's like, well, what do you want to do? You have two years. You want to take out a new minor? Do you want to do something else? And I was like, you know what I want to do? I want to learn French and go to France. I never studied French for a day in my life. Okay. Um, so she was like, do you speak French? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> but how hard could it be? <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just learn French real fast. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so I took French 101 and I yeah. took French 102 in two subsequent semesters uh -huh. and then went to France. And that was it? You were away? And that was it. And by the time I left France, six months later, I was pretty much fluent. Wow. Yeah. Yep. I just I wanted to do it. I, wanted, I, I was like, at the time, I was really interested in composing, never actually wrote anything. Worth nothing at all, but you I mean, some things. I was interested in the art of composition. Okay. But so I would like doodle, you know, if okay. that makes sense. But I never actually finished a piece or anything. Okay. Okay. Um, but I you know, and it was not really for me. I kind of learned yeah. it wasn't really for me, at, you know, in that experience. But I was really into Aaron Copeland at the time, and I was like, oh, well, he went to Paris when he was young. So or when yeah, he was young. Yeah, a lot young. of Americans went to Paris. Sure. A lot of like high profile, a lot of a writers lot of went everybody there. went to Paris. Yeah, true. Americans, to be fair. Russians. Yeah. 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 And um, you lived near Rue de Rome. You were telling me in Paris. I lived in the eighth arrondissement. Yeah. On, um, uh, 99 Rue de Miroménil, which is, um, yeah, it's a small street, um, okay. but it connects the Boulevard de Corse all the uh, way down to like, the, the Champs Elysees. Yeah, it yeah. was right down. Yep. Yeah, because we were talking about Rue de Rome, for people who don't know, um, it's, a, it's a street in Paris beside what is now the CRL de Paris, used to be the CNSM, the main Paris Conservatoire, mm -hmm. now it's a different building, and it's just beside that, and it's all sheet music shops, and instrument makers instrument and all shops, that. Yeah, it's yeah. the music street in Paris, yep. um, and you lived right beside it. Yeah, yeah, it was like uh, I could walk there in 10, 15 minutes, yeah. And you were saying earlier you got a little bit of inspiration from the shops. I did, yeah. So it was it was my time in Europe that, like, I, I grew up in Virginia, but I had never thought you could just, like, walk down the street and, like, be surrounded by music stores. Like, it yeah. was like, like I had a music store in, in Virginia Beach, and I loved 
The owner is very much, you know, Frank Jones and the Flute Tutor, T O O T E R, uh, oh. Andrew Beach. Yeah, it's a great little store, and you know, I love Frank and Ann. Um, but that was the closest thing I ever had to like a flute store. But they sold okay. tubas and saxophones and violins yeah. and everything. Yeah. Um, but I never thought that you could just like have a store that only sold music, right? Okay. And so then I'm on Rue de Rome and I'm like, oh my god, this is just a music store. And I walk in and like it never even occurred to me that like I could buy like a copy of Beethoven's Ninth. Yeah. In full score. Like I literally. Just walk in and wait. Yeah, I never. It was like mind blowing. And so I used to go there and I would just sit in the corner and like read scores like for hours at a time. And they probably thought I was like this, this weird American kid. Which shop did you go? Do you know which one? Uh, La Fouche Pam. Uh, La Fouche Pam was yeah, nice, yeah. yeah. yeah it's yeah. the fancy one though, it's a bit more expensive. Is it? I don't know. Because there's it's... one down the street that they have like these cheap editions as well, which is something I do like about France to be fair, because mm-hmm. they do that with their literature too. They have like the classics and a cheaper version. Uh-huh. And they have, I think it's Arioso, you call it. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. a publisher there and it's much cheaper. Yeah. So, like, for example, my copy of the back partita was two euros. You know, it's that kind okay. of thing. So they do, like, cheap, cheaper oh, paper. Oh, I was, I was buying editions. the most expensive ones. I wanted all the, the Baron the Riders and yeah, the Breitkopfs yeah, yeah. and, you know, yeah. the, the Peters. Oh, they are good, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so, so yeah, it was, it was that experience. It was very formative <laughs> for me. And uh, there's also a great music shop in, in the Netherlands, um, in, in Amsterdam. I haven't been there yet, um, but I've heard about it, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, so, like, all these places made me think, like, I would love to be able to start something like that in the States. Yeah. And it is, uh, this is 2008. I didn't know that. I mean, flute, flute centers didn't have music then, for sure. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I had bought music from Flute World, but I, I don't know what Flute World was. It was like this place of, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. So it never felt like it was accessible to me. And anyway, so I always thought it would be so great if I could go into a store like that in, yeah. in New York. And so in 2016, I decided to, to start it. Okay. And so I built in the basement of my apartment in Brooklyn, Rose Music, which, um, you know, became, you know, the preeminent music destination on the East Coast for, yeah. for Flute. And we're, from what some people are telling me, one of the largest music stores and flute-specific music stores in the world now. It must be, yeah. Um, but I started that in the basement of my apartment in Brooklyn. I rented a little storage unit. Um, and it's like a, maybe 80 or or $100 a month for this little, like, uh-huh. you know, like you had, you had to put a lock on it and you, like, you know, put the the little kind of, like, very, very thin metal But was it an up. actual store or just somewhere to store all the music? It was just, no, it was just a storage unit. Okay. And, like, I bought these Calaxes from Ikea. Oh, I love and the And I Galax, bought those yeah. little, like, uh, they, they were way too wobbly, but these little, like, cloth bins that okay. are supposed to be for, like, holding pillows or whatever. Okay. And I put all, like, like you know, hundreds of scores. I, I mean, thousands, sold them thousands online, of scores. I sold them online only, yeah. Wow. Until I convinced Phil to let me bring them into Flute Center proper. Um, and so at that so, time, Flute Center wasn't selling any sheet music at all? No, none. Okay. Yeah. And actually, when I started at Flute Center in 2012, we didn't sell head joints at all. We didn't sell accessories at all. We literally only sold flutes and mostly used flutes. Okay. We, we had very, very few new instruments at all in 2012. And was it mainly high-end flutes? or It was mainly high-end. Okay. And that, I diagnosed that as like part of my kind of attack or weaknesses yeah. as actually a real strategic problem for Flute yeah. Center in 2012 was we were we were f- focused almost exclusively on the professional class. Yeah. On um, So most of our instruments were high-end consignments, lots of pre-owned Powell's, pre-owned Haynes, pre-owned okay. Burkhardt's, pre-owned okay. Brannon's. Um, and it just didn't make sense to me as a business model. Like, why wouldn't we sell more student flutes than intermediate, yeah. more intermediate than advanced, more advanced than professionals, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Like a pyramid. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. So anyway, getting back to the sheet music story, I built this in a storage unit in Brooklyn and eventually... Um, sold that business to Flute Center proper and bought into Flute Center proper with, oh. uh, with my, my, my sheet music business and my life savings. And here I am 12 years later, uh, co-owner of Flute Center. Man, I love these kind of stories. It's so interesting. Do you know what I'm just thinking, actually, when you're talking as well? What kind of flute do you play? Uh, Miyazawa, Boston Classic, 14 karat gold, oh. silver mechanism. And I have a beautiful um, German Lefen 18 karat head joint on it. Man, that sounds magic. It's magic, yeah. It's, it's, it's really good. And why Miyazawa? <laughs> huh? Why Miyazawa? Is there a reason for it? Or just yeah, you want, to, you want to know the honest reason? I'm going to be entirely honest here. Please do. So it was 2005, February. Um, I was a freshman in college, and I was at the Mid-Atlantic Flute Convention in oh, yeah. um, Reston or Herndon or wherever okay. it was at the year. And I was this like weird chubby kid with hair down to my mid back and bag and a ponytail. Like I used, nice. I used to have really long. Oh really? Hair, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I must have been the weirdest looking person there. Just like just weird, you know, flute typical flute nerd, right? Yeah. And you know, I'm walking around to all the booths, and I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for a flute. I kind of think I want to buy a gold flute. And like none of the vendors gave me the light of day. I went to all the vendors. I went to. Brandon, I went to Powell, yeah. I went to Muramatsu, and some were more generous than others. Yeah. But the one person in the entire hall who actually gave me any attention and actually worked with me was Kathy Miller, 
Oh, you know, yeah. Do you know Kathy? I know of her, yeah. I've yeah, seen yeah. social so media, yeah. So she's like the VP of, of Flute yeah. Authority now at West Music, right? Yeah. So she's like, she's done them all for herself. And, and, and of course, because she's a wonderful person and, yeah. and brilliant at what she does. But it is because of Kathy that I bought the Miyazawa. She was generous with her time. She spent a lot of time working with me uh, yeah. over the course of the next six months and yeah. when I was finalizing everything. And uh, it just goes to show you that, like, you know, would I buy it the same Miyazawa all over again? I have no idea. But I did buy that one. Yeah. I spent a lot, a lot of money buying yeah. it because she was so generous with her time and so personable and nice and just everything that a salesperson should be yeah. in, that, in that context. And that's so important as well. Like, I have the same thing. Like, I sort of st- I play a Sankyu and I sort of stumbled across Sankyu. Um, but now that I've met the people from Sankyu and I've got involved with them and I'm talking to them, I realize, like, I don't want to play another flute because I feel like I'm cheating on them. I've got such yeah. a connection with Sankyo now. I'm like, no, that's my, they're my people. Right, and even yeah. if, I, if I pick up a Miramatsu and I'm like, oh, this is a great flute because they are great flutes, right. I wouldn't switch because I'm like, no, they're my yeah. boys now. And you feel that connection. I think it's really important to feel that with your, with your flute maker as it well. It is, yeah. I'm sure you guys like you guys are quite well known for that as well. Flute Center of building that relationship with your clients as well. Is that Yeah, as much as we can. I mean that that is the entire game. But you wanna feel like it's your shop. You wanna go, no, I I go to Flute Center, they're my people. We Yeah, yeah. For yeah, sure. You want that connection. And we, we really do our best for that. I mean and I I think we're successful more often than not, but you know, we have a teacher program. I don't know if you know about that. Oh, but it's, okay. It's extremely important to our business model. What's the teacher program? I didn't yeah, know about this. It's called Club F C. Okay. Um, oh, anyone yeah. can join the club. But it's a it's a, it's a program for teachers where we give extended perks to the students, longer warranty, free shipping on all trials, um, oh. and we pay the teachers a referral fee for every student that buys. There you go. Um, so we you know we one of our kind of core missions, part of our mission yeah. statement, is to support local teachers, and uh-huh. we, we pay out literally hundreds of thousands of dollars That's a year class. in um, teacher commissions every year. And these build up relationships. It's really important sure. to do them. I mean, like look, he- a typical a, a normal <laughs> teacher who refers every one of her, you know, studio. Yeah, students to us can earn a thousand dollars, several thousand dollars a year. We have some yeah. that earn several. I do the ten ninety nine a year. All end. through the referral. Some, yeah, just you know, it's two hundred dollars here, fifty dollars there. But there are some who who refer the students who earn thousands of dollars a year of extra money for yeah. doing nothing other than say, you know, send your flute to flute center. Go to flute center. That's yeah, it. Yeah. See, that's great. Well, yeah, I have the affiliate thing as well now, and the, like honestly, total transparency in this. When I started the podcast, I had no intention of getting sponsors on, no intention of doing anything like that, nothing. Then it got big, and I was like, okay. Maybe I can make a few quid out of this. Maybe there's something I can do about this. So I emailed everybody, like every flute maker, every flute shop, everything. And I got a lot of offers to come on as sponsors and stuff. But then I also got emails from people who'd heard about it, like, you know, certain gadgets and things like that. And I'd be like, nah, no, because I don't want to get a sponsor on that I don't, I don't actually like myself. Sure. Because my audience would see right through me. They'd be like, they know that I would take the money and run, but I'm not meant to do that. And I would only promote things that I care about. So the only people on the podcast right now, officially, are Flute Center. Because I was like, yeah, I actually think what you guys are doing is really cool. Yeah. And I love the, the instrument trials. I think that's great. Yep. You get discounts on all things. And I think, yeah, they are a good shop. And they're, you should be going to Flute Center. Thank so, you. I yeah. appreciate that. Team yeah. Flute Center, yeah. And Team you guys Flute are the Center. only ones as well that were brave enough to come on to the N9G podcast. You guys jumped on it. <laughs> Nobody else wanted it. Well, Listen, they did want it. I'm an open book. You ask me whatever you want. Oh, man, I, I really could ask you about I want to ask you some fun <laughs> questions as well. Sure. Because we've been talking. Well, have we been talking for an hour, I suppose? Because, yeah, we had a small interlude while. Yeah. 3,000 flute pairs pass us. Um, I, I sent you these questions in advance, didn't I? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. So you're not going to get shocked. Uh, okay, so quick questions. Uh, do you have a favorite flute concerto? So many favorite flute So It's a hard question, isn't it? It's a hard question. Like, it's cliche to say, like, you know, the top three are Nielsen, Lieberman, and Ebert. But, you know, for Will me... you put Lieber- you can- I mean, look, I won a lot of competitions on Ebert. Ebert, I, I agree with Nielsen, but... I love the Lieberman guitar, don't get me wrong, but I wouldn't say it's top three. I'd put really? Mozart up there first. Uh, I mean, look, Mozart's Mozart's kind of a different league, which is why I wrote that listicle for like yeah. 19 concertos that aren't Mozart. But, um, I mean, I won a lot of competitions on eBay, like a lot okay. of them, including concerto competitions. Yeah. Um, so I have a real special place in my heart for yeah. you. I really, really do. But Mozart is, it's just different. Mozart is special. It, you know, Mozart's Mozart, yeah. Yeah, it's Mozart. I mean, yeah. And, you know, the thing about Mozart is you can't hide anywhere. I mean, the phrasing. No. And, you know, if, if you play Mozart well, it's just pure magic. And if you play yeah. Mozart anything other than well, it's kind of hard to listen it to. It doesn't work, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a reason it's asked for every orchestral edition in the world ever. Yeah, you can totally tell, is. honestly, after about 
five seconds of playing Mozart, you can tell everything you know about a flute player. 100%. Or, yeah. And not even a flute player, a musician in general. Yeah. You get everything off them. Yep. So you're going to go with Ebert as your answer? I'm going to go with Ebert. Okay, like final, it. Final answer. Nice. Uh, do you remember the first flute album that you bought? First flute um, album. Either that you I bought, bought or someone like you somebody asked gave you to me. Yeah. yeah. So I was studying at Flute Tutor with Frank Jones, and he gave me a copy of, um, I, was, I forgot which piece I was working on, it might have been Doppler, um, but it was a, 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 an encore piece. Uh, uh-huh. the Ron, Ron, an encore album that Ron Paul did. Oh, okay. Um, and I forgot exactly what the name of it was, but okay. it had the Doppler on it. Um, okay. And it also had, like, you know, other traditional Japanese, you know, pieces. Haruno yeah, he did a lot of Japanese music as yeah, well. Yeah, things time. like yeah. that. And, and, I, and I, oh my God, I just fell in love. Yeah. Um, and he it's actually, Frank gave me a whole bunch of um, CDs. He just okay. had hundreds and hundreds of them. And I think I think I ended up, I have no idea whether he treated all of his students like he treated me or whether okay. I became one of his favorites. Yeah. But he was so generous and just gave me so much and I, I owe a lot to him. Um, but I'll remember the first one that I, that I got, a very special one, was for my um, 16th birthday. My mom bought me the 15 album compilation of Galway's. Oh, the 60 yeah. years, 60 flute masterpieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that was... That was expensive as well? But I'm sure it was. Yeah. It was a birthday present, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and I mean, it's so surreal now because, like, now Galway's, like, in my phone. Is he really? You know, like, he's like, yeah, he said, called me, and I'm sometimes like, well, look, Jim's Galway's called me. I'm so super cool. <laughs> How well do you know Jimmy? Are you friendly with Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, like, I mean, if he sees me, he knows me. I mean, like, I know him. We've had cigars and scotches together multiple times, and, you know. <sighs> I had a whiskey once with Jimmy. I was like, yeah. oh, my God, it's great. Yeah. So, like, I don't know if... Would you be able to find out if Jimmy wanted to come on the podcast, for example? Yeah, pretty sure I don't have those strings to pull, but... Um, ah! Yeah. <laughs> he's, my, he's my, like... That's my mecca. That's, well, that's the one I have. To, I ever, would go to Switzerland to get him. He's a hero. I mean, you know, he's... And also, he's, I'm from Belfast, so I have a partic- particular connection to Jimmy. Sure, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, it's Jimmy, yeah. I need to get him on the podcast. Between yeah. him and Emmanuel Payou. Have you met Payou? Sure. Actually, I have a great story about Payou. Oh, yeah. please tell me a story about Payou. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, I'm a big basketball fan, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yep. What's love your basketball. team? Uh, I am more about players than teams. Okay. So, I love to watch people who are just really good at, okay. their, at, their, at what they do. And right now, there is just nobody better than LeBron James. Yeah. And so, I, I actually lived down in Miami when he moved to the Heat. Loved watching him there. Yeah. Um, Loved it when he brought a title back to Cleveland. Loved, yeah. loved him with the Lakers. Like, I think he's just a phenomenal athlete, and I, I yeah. and a phenomenal human being. Honestly, like you don't find athletes at his level that are so upstanding citizens. And yeah, I, I, yeah. Just, I think the world of him, honestly. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm a big basketball fan, and watching it since I was a small. I'm kid. so curious how he's going to connect to Emmanuel Payu here. This oh, story. it's great. Yeah, it's yeah. a good story. And so one day I'm at Flute Center, and I'm just working, you know, doing whatever I'm doing, and this guy walks in the door, and he's tall, uh-huh. tall. And I look over at him and I go, that's David Robinson. Do you know David Robinson? No, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's the admiral. So anybody yeah. in your audience does know. He is the admiral. He's on the 92 Dream Team. He's like one of the top five does centers of all time. Does he play the flute? Yeah, he does. What? Yeah, 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 he does. I have pictures. I mean, I, I have proof. I have living proof in my phone. Um, and so he walks in. I'm like, that's David Robinson. This is like, a, 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 you know, NBA champ David Robinson, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so, like, everyone else is like, oh, look at this tall guy. And I'm, like, I'm like fanboying here because yeah. I love basketball, yeah. right? I watched him against Michael Jordan and all this stuff in the 90s. Um, I had his basketball cards when I was a kid, you know, like a total fan. And, and I walk up and I said, I'm a big fan. Like, I'm like, I was just like, can I just shake your hand, yeah. get a picture? And he's like, yeah, of course. And so I was like, I didn't know you played flute. He was like, yeah, after I retired, I got into it. It's really peaceful. I really like it. He was playing on a Yamaha. And he was like, yeah, you know, his son at the time was competing in a basketball tournament um, in New York City. So he was in New York. And he was actually staying right across the street from us. And he like, he was like, oh, maybe there's like a place I can look at, try to look at some flutes in New York. And it turns out we were right across the street. Because he was staying at the Trump Towers off okay. of um, uh, Columbus Circle. Okay. And he walked right across the street, came up to our suite, walks in. And he's like, I just kind of, I've never played a gold flute. I want to play a gold flute. I'm like, great. You can play all the gold flutes in the world you want. No problem. Famously so, yeah. And so uh, I picked uh, for him a 16 carat, which is actually really unique. 16 yeah. carat Nagahara that we had just gotten from Nagahara. Okay. I gave it to him. And he was like, it's beautiful. Well, 20 minutes later, who walks in the door? Emmanuel Paud. At the same time? At the same time. What so, a day. What a day. Did he tell you he was coming or did he just... We knew Berlin was in okay. town. And we knew he might stop by, but we didn't know exactly when. And so... I would walk through the door, and um, I said to David, because we had two trial rooms, and so um, David Robinson was in trial room two, what we called the, the one on the, the left, and Paud was in trial room one, 
and he hears even his that first sentence is ridiculous to say. <laughs> David Robinson and two, Paiute and one. Yeah. Um, so uh, Paiute's like ripping off whatever he's ripping off, and yeah. it sounds like the best player in the world, right? Obviously, yeah. <clears throat> and um, and Robinson goes, "Who is that next door?" And I said, oh, "It's Emmanuel Pahud. He's principal of the Berlin Philharmonic." Yeah. And David and David Robinson goes, "Oh my God, I know Pahud. He's my favorite flutist." No way. Yeah, and and he goes, "Can you introduce me?" So he's getting starstruck as well. Yeah, he's getting Man, starstruck what on Pahud. <laughs> Did they meet then? Yeah, I got pictures. Yeah, of the three of us. That is obscene. Yeah, yeah it's it was like one of the coolest days of my life. Um, that is an amazing story. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, so th- this is the best part. For, best part for me, at least. Um, after pictures, Robinson hands uh, Paud the 16 karat Nagahara and plays it, and Paud plays it. Yeah. And Paud goes, "Oh, this is a great flute." Hands it back to Robinson. He goes, "Oh, I wasn't really intending to buy anything, but how could I pass this up?" And he just like on the spot hands me this very very heavy credit card <laughs> and that's and, it and that's it just drops 35k on a 16K on a 16k nagahara. nagahara yeah that's incredible yeah. also the, just a quick side one did i read somewhere that 16k they've trademarked that as well nagahara i have no idea i, I think i read that maybe i might be totally making that up so ignore yeah. that uh it's really I mean, they, they, all, they all buy their tubing from the same yeah. people so it's i don't know how you could trademark a material or i anything. thought they trademarked the alloy maybe i might be yeah. totally wrong um, I don't know. any other secret celebrity flute players any other celebrities popped in the shop over the years? A couple. Um, I forgot her I name. I never thought of this, to be honest. Do you know, um, remember that show Weeds on Showtime? No. Yeah, so it was a story of a housewife that turns marijuana grower. I forgot the name of the person, Sarah Jane Parker or something like that. Um, she came in and bought okay. a food from us. Yeah, that was another celebrity, although she wasn't nearly as, like, um, you know, uh, open and, and she was kind of shy. Yeah, okay. Very, very shy celebrity. I was thinking maybe celebrities come in to buy fruits for their kids as well. Yeah. Oh, here's a good one. Um, Chris Martin, Coldplay. What? Um, yeah, yeah. We sold a, a flute to him online. He just put it in his, in his cart. You know, fifty some odd thousand dollars. Just yeah. How did you know it was Chris? Did his name come up? It was Chris Martin. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you knew it was that Chris Martin. I mean, Martin? it's like a penthouse suite in a luxury in Miami building. We're yeah. Like, then yes, that is yeah. not Chris Martin. <laughs> I don't think there's that many rich, famous Chris Martins. Yeah. Well, there might Chris be. Chris Martin's a good one. I like to think it's Chris Martin. You know, it oh, definitely is. Oh, and then here's the cherry on the cake. We sold Lizzo a flute. You sold Lizzo a flute? Yeah, yeah. So shout out to Agata, um, our director of operations. But she so uh, maybe a year and a half, almost two years ago. Um, uh, Lizzo was going to start a deal with Fabletics. I forgot a line yeah. of whatevers. And um, the vice president or whatever of, of Fabletics calls us up out of the blue on a Saturday and says, I'm looking for like a really special flute. I'm trying to get it for a player who may or may not play it, but I want something really special. Okay. And Degata goes, well, do you have anything in mind? They're like, oh, this 10 carat Hanes. It's got like a diamond in the crown. And Agata's like, well, yeah, but you could just buy this John Lund flute. If you really want a wow factor, yeah. you should buy this John Lund, the Dryad's Touch, right? And so the Dryad's Touch is this 18 karat green gold, fully sculpted keywork. It's got turtles on it. It's got butterflies. It's got leaves on the keywork. Yeah. It's got, you know, it's just like one of the most beautiful works of art you've ever seen. Yeah. And so it took like three or four back and forths with this guy from Fabletics, but you got him to buy it on the spot. $55,000. And like two weeks later, Lizzo's walking down the red carpet at the Met Gala with this flute that she bought from her. No, house. that's the one. That's the one. Yeah. No yep. way. Came from Flute Center. That okay, that's a really good one then. Chris really Martin and man. Lizzo. What a Chris list. Martin, yeah. David Robinson. That's I'm great. sure I can think of more. Oh, um uh, uh, I could do this Andrea all Bocelli. Day. Andrea Bocelli. Andrea Bocelli. Oh yeah, because he does play flute. I know he this, does, yeah. Because yeah. I think he got lessons from Andrea Griminelli. Griminelli, yeah. I think yeah. that yeah. They come in all together all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because they gigged it. I think the Grimanelli support him on his tour as well for a sure. while, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That, he's a great player, Grimanelli. Yeah. He is, yeah. yeah. But Shelly is actually not bad. No, not at all. He's becoming a really good flute player. Yeah. Which, yeah. man, is annoying because, like, you're already a great singer. Can you just leave it alone? Yeah, you just leave, leave Let us do the. Yeah. yeah. Like, you can't, can't have everything. People. Yeah, he's just good at everything. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I've added a new question next. Oh, no, before I do that, do you remember the first album we bought in general? So it doesn't have to be flute music. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this best because I get it's, some wild answers. It's so funny. It's I'm sure you get such get wild me. answers. Okay. Get me. So I was like 11. Uh-huh. And, you know, when you're 11, you're into, like, Disney movies, right? Yeah. So the first album I bought was the soundtrack to Mulan. Mulan. Mulan, yeah. Good one. But before, one of the best Disney movies. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, like, in oh. retrospect... I probably bought it just because it was like new, you know, and I, yeah. that's when you start getting allowance and everything. But like, 
I, I, I mean, for, for soundtracks for Disney movies, like, oh my god, there's so many good ones. Like, Lion King, Beauty and the Beast. Like, Honestly, the best one? Hercules. People do not good. appreciate how good Hercules is. That's an underrated movie. And the music's good, incredible. It's a good point. Yeah, it has a real style to it. I just watched it again. Um, oh, yeah? I have two small kids at home. Okay. You know, two I, and five. And they got to watch Hercules? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. So I'm trying to introduce all the Disney movies to my son. The he's, golden era, like the big ones, yeah. Yeah, the big ones, yeah. Um, and he's into some more than others, but Hercules is a good soundtrack. Oh, yeah. it's great. Hercules yeah. is a good one. First one was the Mulan soundtrack. You're definitely the first person to say that. Thank you. I have not that answer. I kind of assumed I would be. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> new question I've added to the list, actually, because um, I think it's really fun. Do you have a go-to karaoke song? Do you do karaoke? I haven't done since high school, no. Um, what would you do? What would I do? Oh, I've, I have no idea. Probably, um, I might do something like... <laughs> Whatever comes to your head. Like, Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. I could see you doing that. Yeah. I could see you like doing that, that yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, well, we'll make a point of that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll do it. When or I'm in New York, we'll go to a karaoke bar then after. Yeah, sure, yeah. Or Couple something, of something, something like bar. 90s rock, like um, like Blink-182 or, or... Oh, you're a big Blink fan, are you? Foo Fighters, or, I don't know, something like that. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. We'll do that in New York, yeah. What did it... I had Greg Patello on last night, and he said Billy Ocean. I was like, man, I haven't heard the name Billy, Billy Ocean. Ocean. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, if you could switch instruments, it's a weird question for you, I suppose, but if you could switch instruments but still be as good as you are on the flute, what would you switch to? Violin. Hands down. Why? Yep. The music is so good. And is it the rap? Could, yeah, okay, yeah, I get the rap. the rap. I mean, like, and, and I did this like for like six years of my life. I was like, starting in Rue de Rome, I was like buying every piece of violin music I could find. I'm playing on the flute. I have a, on the flute, yeah. Yeah. Doing my own transcription. My own, my own, um, I did perform the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, my own version of it. Seriously? I, yep. I did perform the Bach Chacon and all three of the Bach Partitas. The Chacon on flute is a nightmare. It is a monster of a piece. Yeah, I did perform them you know, on several several occasions. So, like, I love it. And, I mean, I still, like, when I'm just playing flutes or whatever, I'm playing the, you know, like, the, the, the D minor cello suite. Yeah. I love the cello suites. Like, I are. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about violin, but, like, the violin music is just phenomenal. It's, you know, I have all sorts of thoughts on those composers or those period and where the flute wasn't during its developmental period and why we didn't yeah. get the love that we got. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the music for violin is just... Yeah, um, Okay. Yeah, the rap gives away. Greg Patillo said the same thing. Someone else said violin. It's either violin or cello. It's the only two odds I ever get in this. It's almost always cello, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm cello. clarinet. I love the clarinet. Really? It feels like you shouldn't say that as a flute player. It feels like that's the enemy. But yeah. I love the clarinet, man. I think it's well, so fun to play like Mozart what? and the clarinet and do the booty, doody, 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 all that stuff. We don't get to do that. I, I just want to go doody, 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 doody for a few bars. <laughs> okay. We never get to do that. Um, okay, uh, if you could have a career totally outside of music, what would you do? I don't know. Never had like a flight of fancy when you were a kid, like, oh, I'd love to be a... Oh, yeah, well, when I was a small kid, I was going to be both a uh, professional basketball player and a paleontologist. Paleontologist? But, uh, paleontologist, yeah. Why paleontologist? <laughs> Who knows, when you're, when you're like six, seven years old. Who knows what you... Why, why? I suppose dinosaurs, yeah. Like, yeah dinosaurs yeah. are cool, why not? Um, no, but I, not, ne never seriously. I, I probably, honestly, would be a lawyer, and I'd probably okay. be like a really boring lawyer, too. Like, okay. like my, my mind works really good with puzzles and like really complicated kind of ecosystems and understanding yeah. them and you know how to you know how changing this thing over here affects that thing over there yeah okay. so i'd probably get into something really weird like tax law or oh. i know something boring but that i I'd, I'd, I'd be like the best but you'd be in the good world at it, yeah. like this really yeah. weird thing that like everyone one specific needs. niche yeah, yeah. yeah okay like lawyer man good one um okay two questions left if you could have a drink with any musician alive or dead who would it be any musician alive or dead um, well, I already have had drinks with James Galway. So yeah, gonna, I know. I'm going to forego that one. Um, and I, I feel like it shouldn't even be a flute player. Probably um, should be. Probably should be? No. No, I don't think so. No, it wouldn't Honestly, be a flute player. No. Composer, you, maybe. You know who I'd like to have a drink with? Zweel Bailey. Who's yeah. that? He's a cellist. Okay. Swiss. His cello suites are really good. Okay. They're just like, they're kind of next level. They're, they're my favorite. Is he gigging at the minute? Is he a current artist? I think he's pretty current. Yeah. yeah. I don't okay. really know a lot about him, but like, okay. like they were kind of transformative. I mean, like, Yoga Ma's are great also, I, I, but like, I kind of love his the best. Okay. And I don't know anything about him. So I feel like I just like to sit down and be like, 
That's a really good answer. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, for the back chalice weeks, I discovered them because of Cassades. Sure, yeah. Cassades. Yeah. And, oh. Also a, a transformative album. I have them. I listen to them on repeat. Yeah. One of my favorite albums of all time. Yeah. His first time recording the Chalice weights are unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, you know who else I would love to have a drink with? Go. You're talking about first time recordings. And yeah. Like, like, light went off my head. Heifetz. Yasha Heifetz. Yasha Heifetz would be a good one. Yeah. So you, you yeah. first time recording, you hear I have that like, like a seminal recording of him just doing the the take one of the Bach Chacon, and it's uh-huh. just like, ugh. It's, I, I could cry when I hear that. You and know? I feel like he would be a good person to have a drink with as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. I feel I like he so. would be fun. Yeah. Not maybe fun. Fun would be the wrong word, but be interesting. Yeah. It be well, interesting. I hear all sorts of like jokes about, you know, Heifetz or like, he had a, a witty sense of humor. Like I heard like, you know, this one time, um, you know, uh, somebody said to him, oh, um, Mr. Heifetz, how long have you been playing violin? And he goes, oh, since I was six. And the guy says, and I guess you were just a bum on your parents uh, before then or something like that. Like, yeah. Like, oh, so... You've been making money at violin since you were six years old. What, yeah. you just were a freeloader Until before then? then? Yeah. <laughs> and then I had this other joke where it's like, oh, Mr. Heifetz, your, your violin sounds so amazing. And he goes, my violin? I don't hear it. Oh, uh, no, classic, yeah, classic. Classic, yeah. I think, yeah, people have took that joke now and used it. I've heard that one a few times now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I hope it Yasha was the original one. I think so, yeah. Um, and the last question then, what is your favorite drink, alcoholic or non-alcoholic? Oh, it's definitely alcoholic. I mean, And what is it? Bourbon. Straight up bourbon? On the rocks, yeah. yeah. A couple rocks, yeah. I actually tasted a few bourbons last night at the Thank You private party. Um, the bourbons, man, the Kentucky things, they're yeah, yeah. good. Kentucky bourbon. Never yeah. had Kentucky bourbon before. Yeah. And Four Roses, is four, that what you call them? So Four nice Roses bourbon. is actually my favorite. It's also a kind of a pseudonym for me because I... I, I like I'm a, a little bit of a gamer, and so my my screen name is Four Roses. Which oh really? Is okay. A play on the fact that I love their whiskey, but also that me and my wife and my two kids are the Four Roses. Oh right? yeah, perfect. Um, so, but if I can, I highly recommend the small batch select Four Roses. Okay. It's like you, you if you're at the party, you're probably buying like the big bottle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you can get the small batch select, it's okay. it's not actually expensive for the quality, but it is one of the best. Fifty to sixty dollar bottles of bourbon you'll find. Oh, that's the fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And believe me, I have plenty of high end bourbons too. Okay. But like that one for like, I mean, it's not like an alcoholic here, but for an everyday bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, yeah. For, your, for, for the your morning bourbon. bourbon. Yeah, yeah. For your for your nine a.m. bourbon. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's your favorite bourbon? Do you have an absolute favorite? Uh, absolute favorite. Um, no, I, I don't really know much about bourbon. I love Irish whiskey, which sure. is quite similar because it's quite sweet as well. Yeah. Although bourbon's got a little bit more of a kick to it. it does, the ones yeah. I tried last time, I was like, oh, that's. Well, I bourbons it was are sweet. typically sweeter than Irish, you know, yeah. because they have the corn in the mash. I thought they were, but I always like my favorite whiskey is uh, Black Bush by Bushmills, but it's yeah. very sweet. My wife got me a Bushmills for my birthday. The sixteen I love year. Bushmills. Oh, yeah, the sixteen years, lovely. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Yeah, but that's that's my like that's the level of sweetness I want. I think yeah, Bushmills yeah. is very sweet. Irish whiskeys I find are much more subtle than yeah. bourbons, and and that that can be really beautiful. Okay. Too. No, best bourbons, a barrel bourbon. Um, okay. They're excellent. They're usually cast strength though, so you're gonna want to cut those. Any down specific water. brand though? Any Bur- barrel bourbon is the brand. Th- that's the name of the brand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah. Um, barrel bourbon. I haven't heard yep. of. Yep. Widow Jane out of New York is actually phenomenal. Also. Ooh. Um, I have to try one of these before I leave America then. Yep, you should. When I went to Ireland, uh, we definitely went on a kick. We did the the green spot, yellow spot, red spot. We did the you know the Bushmills. We did the. Did you go to Bushmills as well? We we just in the pubs. You know, oh, in the pub you tried it, yeah. My I actually I have a lot of time for Jameson. Oh. I think Jameson's a really nice whiskey. I, I mean, think it's fine, you know. But I, I really oh, you know what we found Jameson. in Ireland? Like, we, we fell in love with. Well, I, don't know, I don't know if you know this. Method and Madness. No. You know that? What is it's that? It's an Irish whiskey. Method and Madness. Uh, Method and Madness. Yeah. You Never it heard of it. Yeah. Where's it from? Do you know? Uh, cork maybe I, I'm not really sure but we it was so good it made such an, such an impression that for a while I was importing a case every year for our anniversary wow yeah and so okay. you know from a whiskey specialty shop in, in London is it quite um, a small baker that I've never heard of I think it's a small maker yeah, okay pretty small well there you are I'm definitely going to try Method that I can't believe I'm yeah. getting tips for Irish whiskey in this podcast this is yeah, great right. I'm, I'm giving you tips yeah here, it's yo. great <laughs> but amazing well also an excellent option for your 9am bourbon <laughs> Don't even tempt me. Like, this trip has been, man, the NFA, like, also, I probably shouldn't say this on the podcast, but, man, the hangover I had this morning oh, was man. vicious. Oh, Drinking yeah. American bourbon is not good for me. And when, I don't know what, when, what man, I know what you put tolerance. it in. Uh, yeah, because yeah. I don't drink whiskey normally, but I'm like, I'm in America, man, I have to have a few whiskeys, but I have a yeah, couple yeah. of bourbons. But you all drink it on the rocks as well, which is quite intimidating to me, because I'm like, oh, I have a bit of Coke or whatever. No Coke in that. 
<laughs> and then my no, head. you can't put coke in a good bourbon. No, I mean, you can't. You but can, you I should have. You put coke with a with a crappy bourbon, you know, like a, like a Jack Daniels or something. But and then I've been drinking margaritas, man, because I've never had a frozen margarita until I came to America. We don't get them in Europe, yeah. and I see them in all the movies, so I've been having them. They're delicious, but they're, they're too so delicious. Good. That's the problem. Yeah, they're get, like dessert. Yeah. They can really. You so have you have a like three of, of them, yeah, and then you're like. And yeah, so my head is very, very well. It was very sore today. I'm fine now because I had a Dr Pepper. I keep telling everyone this. I bought one of these things. Everyone thinks this is filled with water. That's filled with the brim of Dr Pepper, because we don't get Dr Pepper <laughs> and as you much have in the Europe. Hat too. Yeah, man, I, I, I passed the Bubba Grim, Bubba Gum Shrimp Company. Is that what you call it? Yeah. Yeah. Is, are, and I just so, saw so that you're saying Dr. is that you have two sponsors for the podcast. You have if I can get Dr Pepper on Dr Pepper. I, I mean this with the best intentions <laughs> in the world. If Dr Pepper approached me and say you only allow one sponsor, you guys are out. Okay, <laughs> Dr Pepper are straight in. Honestly, I'll I'm sorry, to Emily. but no, Dr Pepper, they're up there. Second fiddle to Dr Dr Pepper, Pepper reach out. Yeah. Well, it's all right. If, if, I wouldn't be offended if you if you landed. Yeah, you, you would. You'd let me have it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure also they would now, outbid us. Yeah. The <laughs> second most popular soda in the states. It overtook Pepsi recently. Did it really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, man. Because you get all the zero sugar versions over here. Like that's the zero sugar Dr Pepper strawberries and cream. Like what is that? Is that a thing? Yeah. It, okay. With strawberries and cream, creamy coconut, root beer. I've never even heard of this. I, man, it's amazing. I don't drink a lot of soda. Yeah. But, yeah. I've been in America for three weeks now. When I get home, I need to drink water again. I haven't drank any water for like three weeks. <laughs> it's too delicious. It's all this Dr. Pepper and Bud Light Limes. Yeah, and just all, all, the sugar, all the sugar great. water, yeah. It's great. We're okay, great anyway. Sugar water. Uh, don't even start me on it. It's great. It's probably why I'm so sick. It's probably why I'm not doing very well because my throat's destroyed. Nah, anyway. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. We've talked a lot. This is great. Um, is there anything you want to say before you go? Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to tell people to check out about Fruit Center? No, follow us on Instagram, yeah. TikTok, Facebook. Um, you know, use the code inline G when you're you making go. your purchases. Um, <laughs> sign up for our newsletter. We're uh, we're always happy. Newsletter's to great, actually. I have the same. Um, it's worth signing up to. We are always happy to hear from our, cl- our customers. So yeah. if you ever have any ideas or wishes or desires, we we are your food store. So we will do we will do whatever we can do to support the community. Yes, man, love that. Okay, well then, guys, we're gonna go. Thank you all very much for listening, and I will see you all next week. Cheerio.